a good portion of what this class is about. Um, we've sort of overviewed, we've sort of met the major characters, the major players in this. Those characters being, of course, the ASP.NET controls, which we saw they live on the server. All right. They have properties that you can set either through the IDE when you initially, well, when they're initialized, when they're created. And then you can also manipulate those things programmatically. So we saw examples where we could show and hide stuff based on the user making uh, a selection, clicking a button, or whatever. And what properties uh, can we change? We can change any of them. All right, so we change the label on a button, we change the visibility of buttons, we change the visibility of things, of other things, of, of, of uh, all that. One control that I didn't talk about that would be useful for your assignment is the panel. All right, the panel allows you to group stuff together. So if you want to, instead of showing and hiding individually a bunch of things, you could show and ha hide a panel and do it all in one swoop. So. That's something for you uh, to look at um, if you're still working on the lab. Um, so we saw the controls, and then we saw how we can code to manipulate those controls. Now, again, this is like we introduced you to these things. So when I say that, that we've been introduced to many of the main concepts, that certainly doesn't mean that we have covered them thoroughly. All right? So what we're going to do for the next few classes is go over... Um, more controls, more programming techniques, and so on. All right, so we're going to get into that so that we really familiarize ourselves with the framework and how we can manipulate the framework and things like that. And then we get into database stuff, and that sort of, and we ride out the rest of the class doing database stuff. Um, what we're going to do today, oh, um, and we can't possibly cover every single ASP.NET control in detail. The idea is if you see enough of them, you start to notice, oh, that's how this kind of thing works. So if we didn't uh, handle a particular control, it should be fairly easy for you to look at it and, and you have a fighting chance on working it out. If you, if you have gone through 10 different controls and you know how they work, it's, easy, it's easier to sort of figure out how the 11th one works. All right, at least that's the theory. So what we're going to do today is we're going to write a very simple game called Hilo for Dice. Does anyone know that game? All right. It's real simple. You know, it's probably meant for kids. And um, if any of you are opposed to gambling, we're not going to be gambling actual bunny here. So it's just going to be points. All right. So I, I think that should be okay. Um, and the way it works is like this. You have, you have a pair of dice. All right. You roll the dice. What are the possible totals that you could get on, two, on a pair of dice? You could get up to 12 and down to 2. All right? So, high-low works like this. You bet. get a 7, 
I am awarded four points. All right. So it costs you a point to play. All right. Or if you lose, you lose a point. If you win, you win either one point for lows, one point for highs, or four points for seven. Okay. Easy enough, right? Pretty simple rules. All right. And I better not see people after class gambling with their lunch money here. All right. Okay. Let's think about what we want our code to look at. One thing I stress in, in most of my classes is, is a couple of things. One is to do a little bit of planning ahead. Now, this class, the focus is not on visual design. All right. This class, you know, the focus is on you know, getting the coding right. Um, that being said, I do expect you to make your pages look like completed web pages. So, because I'm a professor, I'm allowed to act hypocritical, right? So my examples may be very bare bones, all right? And the reason that they're bare bones is because just in the interest of time, I don't want to go through and style it. I may style it a little bit, but I'm not going to spend a lot of effort in that. That being said, you're expected to do complete web pages. You know, it should look like a complete web page. It doesn't have to look like a, 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 an award-winning design page, but it should look complete. It shouldn't be bare bone. All right. But it's a good idea, even if you're not going to consider the visual design a great aspect, to think about um, what our page is going to look like, and maybe think a little bit about the code before we actually try to write it. You know, almost any endeavor is better if you spend at least a little bit of time planning. All right. Um, does planning mean that you have every single detail worked out? Probably not. You know, I plan this class. That is, I knew the topic that I wanted to talk about. I knew the specific example I wanted to use. All right. But certainly, if you folks have questions. I'm going to deviate from that plan a little bit, right? So it's good to have a plan, but by the same token, realize that your goal is to do something good, is to create a good program, not to stick to the plan. So if you decide, if you figure out a better way as you're working on it, by all means, forget the plan and, and do it the better way. All right, let's talk about the user interface here. What are we going to see on the page? What is the page going to look like? to do this game. Okay. Paige, you're going to have a button to roll the dice. A label that will display the results. A label that will display the results. Probably two labels. So we can start out with labels, 
we can go in and, and add the images at a later time. All right. Um, the other thing that we could do is we could keep a tally of what the person had. You know, maybe we start out with 100 points. And as they play the game, that number goes up or down. And if you do any probability, you know that that number is going down because the game is stacked against you in this case. All right, you're getting paid back four to one, and the odds of rolling a seven are one out of six. So you're you're not getting you know, and, and a similar thing for the other ones. But anyhow, I digress. All right. Uh, that's another reason not to gamble, all right, but, but play points. So we got the idea. Now, what's the code going to look like? What's the code that's going to process this going to look like? Pardon me? A lot of codes. Okay. Has anyone seen a picture of, let me see if I can bring it up. just saw this floating around social media lately. I am good at, co at, at Googling. All right. This is, a, this is a programmer that worked on code for, I think, the Apollo moon landing. All right. And her name is, is Margaret Hamilton, I believe, which is the same name as the woman that played the Wicked Witch in The Wizard of Oz. But near as I can tell, they're no relation. All right. This is a stack of the printouts of the code that she wrote. All right. That is a lot of code. All right. What we're writing for this is not going to be a lot of code. All right. That, that gives you a sense of what a lot of code is. So, yeah, if we had a stack of this on printout, it would be like that. All right, so what is our code going to look like? Let's just describe in words what we're going to do. We're going to hit the button, and it's okay. going to generate a random number between 1 and 3 and 6 for each dice. Okay. So first thing we're going to do, and, and one thing that, that uh, uh, an old colleague I, I, I worked with did, he was, he was probably the best programmer I ever worked with. He was brilliant, but he would really make me mad, all right? And he would really make me mad largely because I would disagree with him. After I thought about it a long time, I would realize he was right. And nothing <laughs> makes you more mad than that, right? You know? Uh, I remember arguing with him, with him when we agreed on something, because I had a different reason for saying it than he did. And it wasn't enough for him that I agreed with him. I had to agree with him for the same reason that he thought it. So, but it, that being said, the fellow was brilliant, all right? And, and again, one of the best programmers I've ever worked with. One of his suggestions was to write the comments first, all right? So why write the comments first? Well, there's a couple of real good reasons. Number one, all right. If you write the comments first, that's a way of planning your code. All right. You don't have to worry about the intricacies of the language or, gee, how do you generate a random number in C sharp? Um, I kind of remember, but let me go. You don't have to worry about that detail. You say generate random numbers. All right. And that's enough for a comment. Second reason is, is if you wait until you're done to comment it, you're not going to go back and comment. All right? You know, that's one of the biggest lies that programmers tell themselves is, I'll go back later and comment it. Nope. You're not going to go back later and comment it. <laughs> so true. Yeah, you're not. All right? I'll, I'll tell you that right now. So therefore, it's a good idea to that. Number one, it shows that you're thinking it through. It's always good. Just like if you're, if you're doing a speech, you know, prepare some notes. Have a plan of what to talk about. If you're doing a paper, a term paper, write an outline. All these things are forms of planning before you do it. 
So, we press the button. All right, we're going to generate two numbers from one through six. All right, what's next? Um, let's not worry about the let's not worry about the points quite yet. Let's figure out what radio button they checked. Okay. Get the user's choice. All right. So, find out what the user picked. What's next? Okay. Um, there's another kind of step that's in there first. All right, let's add the two together. Maybe that was implied, but you know, it's good to it's good to think that through. Then you check. All right. See if users choice. matched the result and depending how confident we are you know we can write our pro we can write our comments to, uh, to, to different levels of detail like I think this is clear enough for us I could write the comment that says if low was selected, check to see if the amount was less than less than seven. If if high was selected, check to see if the amount was less was greater than seven. If seven was selected, make sure the amount was seven. So I could write that out, or I could do this, which which implies it. Again, you you know, how do I want to say this? The level to which you plan something depends a lot on your own, like how um, how confident you are that you kind of know what you're doing. All right. Um, that doesn't mean that like you're going to go into it and say I'm completely confident, so I'm going to write no comments. All right. But your comments may vary in the level of detail. All right. Then finally, we're going to have some form of displaying results. And we're going to start out doing this not by keeping track of the number, and we're not going to display the actual dice. Yeah, but we're going to start out simply by saying you win, you lose. All right. So, this code will live on the button click event. All right. And I'm confident that we've thought this through sufficiently to see, um, you know, to, to be able to start this. We at least have an idea of what we're going to do. We may not know every single piece of this, but we have a pretty good idea of what we're going to do, and we can go on from there. All right, so let's go and let's make the app. Someone could get the lights. We may actually do this a couple ways, right? Just to use different controls. We might start out using a radio button, then we might go and use a uh, drop down. All right. So I'm going to click Visual Studio. enjoy a nice can. You guys laugh when I actually get an endorsement deal. Alright? Yep. Hey, you know, times are hard. You 
got to do what you can, right? That's true. What's that song? No rest for the wicked. I got mouths to feed. I got bills to pay. All right. Bills to feed, mouths to pay. Yeah. Hmm. It could be wrong. All right. So I will go new website. I'm going to go and I'm going to create it on the desktop. And I'm going to pick uh, ASP.NET empty website. I am going to pick Visual C Sharp. I'm going to browse to the desktop. And I'm going to select. I'm going to call it high low. I click open. Going to tell me, are you sure you want to make this? Yes, I'm sure. And I click OK. And it actually goes and creates it, and it creates it and containing those two config files, which we'll get to later on in the class. Right now, we just need to know that they need to be there. Those config files also let us know that what our application folder is. So if I say go in and open up the application folder, I mean the folder that contains the web config files. All right, so I'm going to go in here, file, new, file, web form, place code in a separate file, yes, Visual C Sharp, yes. And I'm going to click Add. <clears throat> and I get my page. All right. I'm going to go and pin the toolbar. I do wish that, like, the screen was, like, a little wider because I have to, like, to, to look at one thing, I have to, like, squash the other stuff and all that. But... Now, I can go and I can do this um, either in visual view or I can do this in, uh, or design view they call it, or I can do it in the code view. So I'm going to go in and again, keep in mind I'm not really paying too close attention to um, the appearance of it. Um, I will go and I will create, first of all, a radio button list. All right. Um, Radio button, the option above it is, is just for a single radio button, where I don't want a single radio button, I want a group of radio buttons. All right? I want to be able to say high, seven, or low. So I'll go and I'll drag that over, radio button list. Now, shows me that. I'm going to go into properties. I'm going to change a few things. First of all, I'm going to change the name of it from radio button list one to radio button user choice. All right. It's still early in the semester. I still have a relatively high amount of energy. All right. Due to Mountain Dew Kickstart. All right. Um, and Therefore, I'm not going to be lazy and just leave it as radio button one. That's a bad habit to get into, but I do confess sometimes in the interest of time, I, it, it just escapes me and I just leave it as the default name. All right, so radio button user choice. All right, so that's the one thing I'm going to do. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create the actual radio buttons. And this is where really radio buttons and drop downs are similar in concept. They just look different, right? A radio button, all your choices are shown all the time, uh, and you can select one. A drop-down, typically only one selection is shown, and you have to click the little arrow to see all of them, and then you make your selection. So conceptually, they're the same sort of thing, a list of options of which you can choose one. So what I'm doing here for radio buttons is going to be real similar to what I do for a drop-down. At any rate, I click this and choose data source we are not going to do now. We'll do that later on when the options for radio button will come from a database. 
All right. So for example, if I had a company and the company had multiple departments, well, there'd be a list of departments in a database. Well, I wouldn't hard code my radio buttons to say accounting, accounts receivable, sales, marketing, and so on. I would have a table that contained those. So as soon as I added it to the da database table, the buttons would reflect it. We're not quite up to that point now, however, so I'm going to click edit items. And edit items allows me to go and add a series of items. So how many options do we want? We want three. We want high, low, and seven, or low, high, and seven. So I click add. All right. Like a dropdown, and in fact, even if you remember the HTML code that this generates, associated with a radio button or associated with a dropdown are two things. All right. The thing that the user is going to see and the thing that the code is going to see, the value, I should say, instead of thing, the value that the user is going to see and the value that the code is going to see. So, for example, the text for the first radio button, I'm going to say low, and I'm going to say two through six. That's what the user is going to see. That way, if they can't remember the rules of the game, that, that's descriptive enough to tell them that, that that's what low means. Now, the value depends on what the program expects. All right? Well, I haven't written the program yet, so the program doesn't expect anything. But I'm going to say that the program expects a 0 for low, a 1 for 7, and a 2 for high. All right, that ought to be my convention. So I'll make the value for this radio button zero. So the script will see a zero when low is selected. All right. I can then click seven, which means seven. And it has a value of one. Then I can pick high, 8 through 12, and I can give a value of 2. This is an important concept, the fact that we can represent to the user something one way and pass to a script another value. And you see that all the time, right? For example, you know, um, if you wanted to pick... You know, if you wanted to um, do a search for instructors uh, here at, at LC, if there was a directory page that showed a list of all the instructors and you wanted to pick one and see their biography or whatever, all right? If that showed my faculty ID number, that would be meaningless to you. You don't know what, whose faculty ID number is what. All right? It wouldn't make sense to you. What do you know? Well, you'd know the faculty member's name. All right? Yet, the script behind the scenes probably needs a faculty ID number because that's what the database is going to be keyed on and so on and so forth. So, a lot of times there is, you know, a way of representing it so the user understands and a different way to represent it so that the script understands. Another thing, it would be like the difference between a product and a, uh, a, a product ID code, like a UPC code. So for example, if I had at the bookstore a choice of what to buy and I wanted to buy Lemon Lime Kickstart, all right, I'm not going to know the UPC code, yet their inventory system might need the UPC code, all right? So if this was like an online sort of thing, you know, I would want to see the, the, the verbal description, but behind the scenes, I'd want the UPC code. All right. So that's what our radio button group looks like. We have a lot of properties here. We can choose and set some of these. Do we want it, for example, to be oriented vertically or horizontally? Maybe. All right, have I gone 
blind. There we go. I kind of like vertical better. Makes it clear what choices are what. All right. With this, I always have a question like, is that the button that goes with low or is that the button that goes with seven? Where vertical, you don't have that issue. Okay. So we have the drop-down control. All right. What else do we need? Well, to start, we're going to need um, a button and three labels. Okay. So let's go and put our button here. And let's go and put our labels here. Button, I'm going to say button roll. So that's rolls the dice. Label one, I'm going to say I don't want any text in it to start. I know the singular of dice is die, but that always sounds so harsh. Die one. So I don't care. I'm going to say dice one. And the grammar police can come and arrest me. And then finally, label result. Now, I could go in and... Um, I still have text in We don't see any labels yet because we took the text out of them. If I do a view source, we can see from the client's perspective what is what those controls generated. And those controls generated, interestingly enough, because I said it's vertically, it generated a table. All right. I'm going to boo that for a minute because that's really not good web development. All right. It generated um, each of those three radio buttons has the same name. That's what makes them act like radio buttons, right? The fact that they have a name in common. Each of them has its own distinct ID, which you need IDs to be distinct. And there's the value, and then there's a label for the radio button. All right. So the label is what the user is going to see. The value is what the script is going to see. We have our submit button. And then we have three spans. And spans are simply um, inline code where you can put stuff. It wraps around inline code. It's the inline equivalent of a div. A div simply wraps around a chunk of stuff. A span is like that except it's inline and divs are um, block tags. Alright, so let's go and build this a piece at a time. First thing I want to do, let's say, and let's do it pretty much in the order that we described there, is I want to roll the, the pair of dice. Okay? So, I'm going to double click the button and that will take
take me into the code behind. I double click it. Notice I have button roll click here. That's where my code is going to live. Remember, we're going to double check and check and make sure that the button itself has on click, button roll click. All right? That's what really ties the button to the, the physical button to that piece of code. So what am I going to do now? I'm going to roll the two dice. All right? And I want to display the result of them. Well, what data type would I have for each of the dice? Uh, an integer. An integer. Pardon me? What's the other one? Is it oh, this decimal, this integer, and the double? Double. 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 Yeah. Double. Yeah. double. Say integer D1. And D2, declaring those variables, saying what kind of data type is going to be in them. We also know we need a, a, a value for the total, right? So I'm going to say int D total. All right. What's the little squiggly line mean? It means we haven't used it yet, all right? So it's not really an error, but it's kind of like, well, you know, yeah, you haven't used that yet, so why are you declaring it? All right, how do you generate a random integer in C sharp? No one remembers, all right? <laughs> I don't remember, all right? I teach a lot of different classes in a lot of different languages. So it may look like, gee, has this guy ever programmed before? But really, it's a case of like, yeah, I know you can generate a random number in C sharp. I have better things to remember, right. all right? I, you know, I, I have to remember that this is a four-day weekend coming up and, and all the fun I'm going to have and stuff like that. I don't have space in there to remember, like, how to generate that. So what do you do? You Google it. I never have and, and again, it's one of those things that, like, the stuff that you did all do all the time, you remember. But the stuff that you don't do so often. So, like, if you were writing games in C Sharp, you'd know the random function, right? <laughs> well, yeah. But, like, someone like me who typically doesn't focus on that kind of application, look it up. So, C Sharp, random integer. How do I generate a random number, random int number in C Sharp? Now, the interesting thing is I actually did this earlier today, and I, 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 could, I could have predicted the answer. The answer is going to be on this page, but there's going to be like a million answers saying, why don't you just Google it? You know, why do you post a question? And then there's going to be arguing about someone's going to have another way to generate a number, and they're going to claim that, that their method is better than the other method. And then the one person's going to start insulting the other person, and then the other person's going to insult that. So you kind of have to filter through this. Um, actually, the best thing I've seen on the Internet recently is I was looking at a, a, a video of a piece of music, and someone wrote a very polite comment that said that they simply didn't like the piece, and they explained it. And... Exactly. And someone wrote something like, what a very well-reasoned, thoughtful, and, and intelligent comment. You don't belong on YouTube. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. All right. How do I generate a random number in C sharp? First comment. Sure, it would be stupendously easy to find this answer to the question with a simple search. Blah, blah, blah. It bugs me too. But, all right. Eventually, <laughs> we come down to this, all right, that we can declare a random class, all right, and we can call a next method on the random class and generate a number between one and one less than the last number. So if I want a one through six, I say next one comma seven. Don't ask me, I didn't make this up, all right. So, I'm going to go in here in my code. 
and I'm going to say D1 random next whoops I already declared it not 1 through 13 but 1 through 7 Yeah, one more. You know why that is? Usually random number generators work like this. They, the, they, they generate a number between 0 and 1. They generate a decimal. Then they multiply the decimal by the upper limit. And so if the upper limit is 7, if you have a decimal that is less than 1, and you multiply it by 7, you're going to get 6. And then you truncate it off. So that's, that's probably why it's doing that. All right, and I'll say D total equals D1 plus D2. All right. Well, D2 should be 6 through, what was it? No. Each, each, die, each dice has a value of 1, yeah. Right. And then the total. Okay, so let's go and let's display these values in the label. Let's just get this part working. All right. Because then, you know, again, this sounds silly, and this sounds like like advice that, like, I don't know, Dr. Phil would give or something. But it's good for your self-esteem to get something going and working, even if it's not the whole thing. That's true. All right? So, in other words, let's say that it was 4.50 and quitting time was 5 o'clock and I was winding things down. If I at least have the dice roll working by the time 5 o'clock rolls around, I got that done. That's in the record books. I finished that. Next day I can start with the next piece of it. If, however, I try to hit a home run and put all the code to do everything in there, and of course it doesn't work, because while it might not be a lot of code compared to the Apollo landing, there's still going to be a fair amount of code in here. All right? There's going to be a little piece of code in here. If I leave and nothing's working, it's like nothing's working. And from a technical perspective, it's better to do things in chunks. And I think for just like a, a, a self-esteem or a motivational reason, it's good to like set yourself little milestones, get to them, okay, I got that. I go on to the next piece. That's good too because then, for the most part, if there's a problem that you encounter later on, you're like, well, I know it worked up to this point, so probably whatever I did since that time is what messed it up. All right, and usually you're right. All right, so let's display the dice in there. So what were my labels called? Label dice one dot text. Remember that the label dice one is a label object. Objects have a lot of properties associated with them. So I can't just say label dice one equals. I have to say what property do I want to change? I want to change the text. And what does that equal to? It's going to equal to D1 except I get a squiggly. Why do I get a squiggly? All right. C sharp doesn't do any sort of what are called implicit conversions for you. Implicit, you know, means implied. So in other words, what I want to do when I make this statement, it's implied that I want to take that integer and turn it into a string and then stuff it into um, a, uh, a text box. How do I turn this into a string? <laughs> All right. That says, okay, make it a string. Now that sounds, that's actually a good thing. All right. When you, when the compiler does conversions for you, in one respect that can be convenient because it's, it's a little less code that you have to write. But in another respect, it may be doing conversions that you didn't intend. All right? Being a strongly typed language, c sharps makes sure that you have to match up the data types no matter what. 
Therefore, it's not going to do any of the work for you. Therefore, it's never going to surprise you and convert a variable without you realizing it. You have to explicitly convert every type to, to do that. The one exception of that is I might be able to like move an int into a double or something like that. That, it might do that conversion for you. The other way around, it might not, right? Because one's a bigger number than the other. All right, so I do this. All right, and I should be good to go. So let's go and run this. Sure looks like this is working. Alright. This does beg the question, how do you test if you have randomization in your program? Yeah. Well, you can run a lot of tests to make sure it doesn't give you anything outside of the range, like it doesn't give you a negative one for the value of a dice or seven, but that is a little dicey. I mean, pardon the pun. I, I swear to God I did not intend that. Uh, I, I, God, I wish I was that clever to, to uh, have said that. Uh, but, um, you know, you never know if there was some... Now, again, this code is really straightforward, but like in a bigger thing when there's random elements involved. Uh, all right. Okay, so we got this. We're at 5 o'clock, and it was quitting time, and the... I always remember the Flintstones. The boss would pull the tail of the bird, and the bird would squawk, and Fred would slide down his dinosaur and slide into his car and drive off into the sunset. Fred would be happy if he made it to this point because he accomplished something that day. All right? All right, so we want to continue on with this. I'm actually going to go and close out of this and pretend that it's quitting time. Why? Because I want to review with you how you open up a web app after you have saved it. So let's go here. Let's close. And I'll go into Visual Studio again. Five chicken recipes. This is so amazing. All these things, these things, all the things that these things do without worrying about it. Like my phone tells me how far away I am from home. You're 15 minutes away from home. I'm, to my knowledge, I never once asked my phone to tell me that, and yet it does it. And that makes me wonder because, like, my battery is draining, and it's like, I know where I am. So, you know, why is it monitoring this? And, again, uh, the pitfalls of technology. File, open, website. All right. So we did file, new website. Now we're going to do file, open website. We will go into the folder that has the web config file. In this case, that's high, low, and we open it up. Yes, we understand that, that this is configured as an application, and we are good to go. All right. So here we go. So now what do we want to do? Well, we want to look at, we want to look at, <coughs> the user's choice and see if they've won or lost. This is one of those things that I think comes with like experience and dealing with these kind of problems a lot. I am going to assume that they are wrong and test to see if they are right. Why am I doing that? Well, it's going to end up being easier to code. You don't believe it? Try coding it the other way. All right. I'm reasonably sure it's going to be easier to code if I assume that they're wrong and 
test to see if they're right. Again, I could do this a bunch of different ways, but I'm going to create a Boolean for my results. What's a Boolean? It's a variable that can either be true or false. And I'm going to initialize it to false. I want to grab the value that the user selected. What is the value that the user selected? It's going to be the attribute of the radio button that corresponds to the value of the selected item. All right. There's probably a couple ways that we could figure this out. One way is to go to Google, do uh, a search, probably end up on Stack Overflow and get the sys through the arguments and the name calling and all that. Like ASP.NET radio button list find value chosen. <laughs> I need to find the selected item from a radio bit. Oh, using JavaScript. Okay. Actually, that is a little different. And we can sift through there. What's the other way? The other way is IntelliSense. All right. IntelliSense is, is a Visual Studio's way of, like, if you put the first part of something in, it tells you what your options are. And especially after you've gotten used to, to using some of these components, um, that's a pretty reliable way of getting straightforward answers anyhow. It works most of the time. All right. So I'm going to create an integer for user choice. And I'm going to say user choice equals, it's going to have something to do with that radio button user choice, dot, and I can select through all these things, access key, that doesn't look like it, style, color, There are a lot of things to scroll through, potentially, but you can probably skip a lot of them. This looks like a good candidate, selected value. It gets the value of the selected item in the list control. Yeah, that's what we want, right? We want the value of what the user selected. So we have a winner. Now, don't be confused with there's a couple of other things in here. One of them is selected index. What do you think the selected index is? It's place in the list. It's place in the list. Now, interestingly enough, um, in this case, they're the same, the selected value, because I made it 0, 1, and 2. Not intentionally. Um, I guess intentionally, but I didn't think that it would be the same as the selected index, but it tells you the position. I don't like to use that one. Because if I were to change the cosmetically the order in which the things appear, uh, I'd have to then go and change my code. Whereas as long as I could rearrange the items, um, and if I was using the value, that as long as I kept the values the same, I wouldn't have to change my code if I rearranged the values of the radio buttons. Selected index changed. What is that? Okay. That actually, if you notice, there's even a little different icon next to it, and that indicates that it is not an attribute, it's an event. So we can write code based on when they change it. 
All right. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But we're not going to use that. We're going to use the button. That way the person could be like trying to use their psychic powers. Wait a minute. I think it's a seven. No, I think it's going to be low. Uh, and then they don't roll the dice until they click it. We don't necessarily want the selection immediately um, as soon as they click on one. We want to give them a chance to look at it and say, yeah, that's what I want. Boom. Select an item. What do you suppose a selected item is? Exactly. It's, a, it's not a string value of the value of the radio button. It's actually a radio button object. All right? And the radio button object itself has a lot of properties, right? The label and this, that, and the other. So. If we want the radio button object, we would use that. Most of the time, though, we want to use a selected value because that's what we're interested in. We don't care about the color of the radio button's background or whatever. We just care about what value was selected. So I'm going to pick selected value. And guess what? We get a squiggly. Why do we get a squiggly? Okay, there's probably a better answer than because it's squiggly. Use parentheses. That probably, this isn't a method. This is an attribute, so we don't use parentheses. It's because it's a different value type. It's a different value type. All right. What is the selected value of a radio button? What data type is it? Sure. It's a string, right? If we look at HTML, we can put anything between those quotes. We could, I, I happen to put a uh, 1, 2, and 3, or I'm sorry, 0, 1, and 2, but I could have put A, B, and C, all right, or whatever. So therefore, I can't take a string and stuff it into an integer. I can't automatically. It won't implicitly do that conversion for me, all right? So what do I do? I have to convert it. How do I convert it? And how do I do that? I should be able to do this. Or not. That's what you do in Java. Someone's um, 
year of birth and it calculated their age. All right. Um, how would you know if it was a text box that they put a number in there? Well, you could do validation. You could also do exception handling. You could try it and see if it was, and if not, throw an exception or whatever. But for now, I'm confident enough to saying, you know, we rigged the deck. We know these are integers, so we can just leave it at that. So, now we're going to write the series of if statements that are going to determine whether they've won or not. So I'm going to say, if. user choice equals zero and d total is less than seven then guess what they want so I'm going to set B1 to true. If the user choice is 1 and D total equals 7, then they've also won. Equals equals. Ah. Uh, finally, if user choice equals two and D total is greater than seven b1 equals true. Now I can say if b1 label result dot text equals u1 I'm going to finish this code, then we'll go, I'll come back and have a few words about it. Else, okay, so let's run it. What should we pick? Seven. We'll pick seven. One and one, I lost. Let's pick high. One and three, I lost. Let's pick seven. Six and five, you lost. <laughs> Yay! So I'm one for about... 12. All right. Okay, let's go back and look at the code. And again, we, we did some testing. Um, to thoroughly test this, and then, again, this is where random numbers makes things tough to test, right? To thoroughly test this, I would test this until six things happened. What do you suppose those six things would be? I won and lost on each one, all right? And again, um, that would be sort of a minimal testing, all right? Because I want to make sure that if I pick something less than seven, and I said it was going to be less than seven, that I won. Or if I picked it was going to be less than seven, and it turned out to be higher than seven, then I lose, all right? These, of course, are if statements. In if statements, you have a condition, or you have a Boolean expression. 
something that the server can evaluate and determine if it is true or false. All right. To compare equality of things, you use the double equal sign. So here I'm asking if user choice is equal to zero, I have the double equal sign. That's different than the assignment up here where I'm assigning a value to user choice. All right. The two ampersands represents an and condition. That means both of the two mini conditions have to be true for the whole condition to be true. So if the user's choice was zero and the amount was less than seven, then they won. Down here, notice I just have B1. How can I do that? Why can I do that? Why well, don't I have to say B1 equals something? Because B1 is already a Boolean. All right? B1 is already a Boolean expression. We define it as a Boolean. Therefore, we don't have to evaluate anything. We don't have to test to say it's true. This is actually equivalent to saying if B1 equals true. And it would work the same way. It's just, in my mind, it's a little cleaner, a little clearer to, to, to code it that way. Why do you suppose I did it this way? And I could, I, instead of putting B1, say using this Boolean, I could have put the label result text equals you won, you lost, in every one of these if statements. Why did I do it with a Boolean? I could actually get rid of the Boolean and I could still write the code simply by setting the label. It's less code? It's, less code? it's more neat. Maybe. I think it's easier to change. Easier to change. And you know what? If, I'm, if I ask a question like this and you have no clue what I'm talking about, maintainability. maintainability. Just shout out that word, all right, and you'll impress me, all right? Or, alternatively, it's easier to change, all right? Why is this easier to change? Well, think if I wanted to change the message, all right? Think if I wanted to change the message to um, great job or try again, all right? If that message was coded in four or three or four different places, I'd have to go and change it in three or four different places. Here, I'd only have to change it in one. Or maybe if I want to make this, this game a little more um, interesting, I could actually randomly choose from a set of different uh, responses depending on whether they're right or wrong. And that just, it, again, it makes it cleaner. All right. I could also show that they are right or wrong in a different way. I could show like a big thumbs up if, if they were right, a big thumbs down if they were wrong, or someone nodding their head yes or shaking their head no or whatever. All right. So whether they won or lost conceptually is a Boolean. How I choose to represent that visually to the user is another thing. So that's why I separated those two out. All right. Now. There's still some things we could do to make this better, all right? There's a couple pieces of functionality we didn't have in here. We didn't, we didn't keep track of, like, how many right they had, all right? Um, we didn't, uh, uh, we could show an image instead of the numbers, all right? To, uh, an image of the dice to, to, instead of the numbers, all right? Um, there's some things, like, with validation we can do and all that, but... We have our first pass at it, all right? Now, in every English class I've ever had, the instructor has said the key to writing a good paper is revision, all right? Very few people can bust out a perfect term paper the first time through. A lot of students try, all right? Like the night before is due to sit down and bash it out, but you know, if you're successful at that, more power to you. Most people do a better job if they go through a series of drafts, you know. Get all your thoughts down once, step away, maybe have someone else look at it, come back later, well, realize that maybe you were very repetitive and, and you said the same thing over and over, or 
that that certain parts of it are a little confusing to read, or you could use a better word, a more precise word to explain something, all right? And then going by and revising. The process of doing that encoding is called refactoring. So what we're going to do next week is we are going to add a few features to this and make it work a little better, all right? But then we're also going to go through and um, in addition to adding features, we're going to make better code. And what will our criteria be for it being better code? And it'll be exactly that. Maintainability and maintainability's cousin in the ability family. Reusability. All right, those two things taken together are criteria of why I can say this piece of code is better than that piece of code. You know, um, to be sure, sometimes there's a couple ways to do something, and you could look at it and say, yeah, this way is as good as that way. But that's not true in all cases. In many cases, there are objective reasons why one piece of code is better than another. And some of that gets into, like, air, air checking and, and, and how robust it is. A little bit of it gets into efficiency. Uh, less so with the powerful machines that we have now. In the old days, efficiency was a bigger issue. And, of course, a key component that I stress in this is maintainability because you know something is going to change about this, uh, whatever project that you're working on. So to be able to handle those changes easily is uh, an important, uh, important ability to have. All right, I will post this example up to Canvas. And we'll see you over in lab. Does anyone have a thumb drive I can borrow?